Hello and welcome to A Tactical History of Liverpool. Just as in 1964, after winning the Football League the previous season, Bill Shankly saw no reason to make changes to his team over the summer of 1966. A teenage Glaswegian was given a trial, but wasn't taken on, signing for Celtic instead. Liverpool made an iffy start to their league campaign, losing two of their first three games, but by the time we catch up with them in December, they had risen to third in the table, winning five of their last six matches. The Reds had lost Jerry Byrne to injury in their first match of the season. Gordon Milne took his number three shirt, but when he succumbed to injury too, the task fell to young forward Bobby Graham. Once Milne returned though, he slotted back into midfield, with Willie Stevenson filling in at left back instead. Winning the league the season prior gave Liverpool another shot at the European Cup though. The Reds were drawn against Romanian champions Petro Lalpleshti in the first round, giving their 1966 title as their last. Petro Lal weren't exactly giants in Romanian football, let alone European, yet Liverpool made tough work of them. They won the first leg 2-0 at Anfield, but then fell to a 3-1 loss away, necessitating a third leg to be played on neutral ground. Liverpool would advance with another 2-0 victory, but it wasn't exactly a great start to their European campaign when they were meant to be one of the favourites. In the second round, they were paired up with a little-known Dutch side by the name of Ajax, 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 Ajax. Ajax. The last time we discussed Ajax in episode 8, they were in the relegation zone, with manager Vic Buckingham departing for Fulham. Under Buckingham's successor Renus Mickles, Ajax would avoid relegation by just three points, but then the next season they would win the league by seven. When they met Liverpool in December, Ajax were five points clear at the top of the league, and still undefeated. Obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, it's clear that Liverpool shouldn't have taken their opponents lightly. This was the Ajax of Renus Mickles, after all. However, it's not exactly shocking that they did. Dutch football wasn't exactly well respected at the time. The national team hadn't qualified for a World Cup since 1938, failing to get past the first round when they did, and had never qualified for a European Championship. Their clubs didn't fare much better, getting knocked out in the first or second round of the European Cup every year except one, when Feyenoord made it to the semi-finals in 1963. Being undefeated in the Eredivisie didn't really mean a lot to foreign clubs. Even if Ajax were being underestimated by foreign sides, it's also important to state that this wasn't the total football side. A lot of the ingredients were there, Ajax, Renus Mikkels, Johan Cruyff, but this was right at the start of their development. Ajax had long been a home for technical passing football, with Buckingham continuing on a tradition started by Jack Reynolds, but Mikkels took this even further, with training sessions focusing even more on ball work. Mikkels had also ditched Buckingham's WM in favour of a 4-2-4, following a wider trend in football towards a back four but the 4-3-3 that would become the foundation for Ajax's way of playing to this day wouldn't appear for a few years yet. This Ajax side features some interesting attacking movement, with players drifting away from their nominal positions into space, but the fluid position swapping wouldn't come until later, and neither would the extreme pressing or offside trap. This wasn't the revolutionary side of the early 70s that we associate with Mikkels' Ajax, but instead simply a very good attacking side. At this point in the development they were quite similar to Liverpool, a 4-2-4, attacking passing football, and some good movement. A strong European team, but not legendary. Liverpool came into the game thinking they would be pushovers though. I remember that we were delighted to get Ajax because they were supposed to be the weakest team. <laughs> Shankly had claimed to Dutch television that Liverpool hadn't bothered to scout Ajax. We know of them, but we haven't seen them play. You have never seen them play? No. This wasn't true though. They had been to see Ajax's clash against lowly Telstar, and despite Ajax's win, had come away more impressed with their opponents. It had been Ajax's worst performance of the season though, and so Liverpool, already confident of Ajax's inferiority, had come away even more convinced that they would make short work of the Amsterdamers. They received a scoop picture of them though. This poor performance was an outlier rather than an accurate reflection of Ajax. Not that Shankly was particularly interested in their findings. We knew nothing about the players then. We used to send a scout to go and watch the team, but... Um... I don't think we took very much notice of it, you know. Ruben Bellet had the job of going to have a look at the opposition. And now Ajax were an emerging young team with Cruyff and Niskins and all those guys in it. Ruben would come back and Shanks, and the, you know, he's got us in the little room at the training ground with the boards, you know, and the men on the board. And now, boys, this is the European Cup and this is it, you know. This is what we play for, you know. So he's given all of the hype and Ruben then chimes in and he says, I, and they're not a bad sight. Ruben, we're not interested in them, he says. <laughs> so Ruben, who had been away for a week, getting this dossier, never got a word in. 
There were questions over whether the match would go ahead at all, though. A thick fog had descended upon Amsterdam, and it was only getting worse as the game approached. Liverpool wanted the game postponed, but with an important fixture against Manchester United on the Saturday, they also didn't want to have to wait around for another day in Amsterdam. The Italian referee was initially going to call off the game, as it was impossible to see from goal to goal, but an official stepped in and said that in the Netherlands, if the goal was visible from a halfway line, then the match went ahead, and so the two teams played on in the fog. Liverpool set up in their usual 4-2-4 formation, but with Jerry Byrne and Gordon Mill missing, it was a weakened team. Willie Stevenson was moved to left-back to cover for Byrne, which in turn meant Ian St. John was moved back into midfield to partner Jeff Strong, as Bobby Graham took up his position in attack. Ajax also lined up in a 4-2-4 shape, and were without left-winger Piet Kaiser, who was replaced by 20-year-old Cease the Wolf. The youngster, in one of only a handful of appearances for Ajax, would open the scoring just minutes into the match. Ajax won a throw in deep in Liverpool's half, attacked the box, and sent the ball to the back post, where the Wolf headed it home. Fifteen minutes later, Johan Cruyff made it too. Sark Schwartz dribbled past several players, pulling Liverpool's defence apart, then knocked the ball inside to Klaas Nuninga. The forward shot was saved by Tommy Lawrence, but Cruyff was on hand to tuck away the rebound. Shortly before half-time, Ajax added another two. The two teams played pinball in the box following a free kick until Nuninga finally scrambled it across the line. Then, following a corner, Swart attacked the byline and crossed into the box, where an Ajax player attacked the near post and then flicked the ball on for Nuninga to nudge across the line, claiming his second goal just four minutes after his first. It was only half-time and Liverpool were already four goals down. Now it's probably time that we address the elephant in the room, or perhaps more appropriately, the gorilla in the mist. This game really shouldn't have gone ahead. In episode 6, we talked about how the television technology of the time didn't really deal well with bad weather, making it difficult to work out what was going on but this was a level beyond that, and the fog would only get worse for longer the game went on. Even those present in the stadium couldn't work it out. Unable to see, the commentator simply gave up trying to state with any certainty what was happening. All I can tell you at the moment is the goalkeeper, Jerry Balls, has got the ball, throwing it out somewhere. And somebody is down, but just what is going on, it is absolutely impossible to tell you it. And they scored, have they? I think they've got a goal, I honestly couldn't tell you who it was. While well, Ajax's supporters would celebrate their goals in stages, those who could actually see the goals reacted immediately, and then the rest of the crowd reacted to those celebrations. Shankly even claims to have wandered onto the pitch at one point to tell his players to calm down, and noticed by the referee. You couldn't see the game at all, Clive. I was on the pitch. The referee never saw me. Oh, not another one. We, were, we were down to nothing, you see. And, and yes, Strong and Wally's teams are trying to retrieve the game and there's another game to take place at Anfield. So I went on to the field to tell them. Uh, and the referee never even saw me. And the, and the press were reporting the match in, in full detail and I couldn't see the game sitting in the touchline. You need only to look at the goals to see it affected the players. The first sees the ball crossed into the box but then disappear from view in the footage. Lawrence comes out to claim it and suddenly stops. Then De Wolf gets above Chris Lawler to head it home. He doesn't take a genius to recognise the players, both Liverpool's and Ajax's, probably couldn't see where the ball was until it appears in front of them. I couldn't see what was happening once the ball went over the halfway line. I didn't know where it was, you know. And then it, it suddenly appeared again, you know. But uh, being a defender, I knew when Nate scored, <laughs> when Ajax had scored. Likewise, the third sees Ajax shoot from distance at a free kick. Liverpool defend it, and the ball ping-pongs back and forth before it's finally poked across the line. Again, the players seem to just be reacting when the ball arrives next to them. The fourth was another cross into a box full of players who likely couldn't see where the ball was coming from. Do Ajax score these goals in normal weather? No, probably not. But does that mean this game can be completely written off? After all, Ajax were playing in the same fog, yet they didn't concede four goals. It's not like they could see any better shown by them getting confused when the referee blew his whistle shortly after the third goal and walking off thinking it was half-time. Those on Liverpool's side would probably like to pin this result entirely on the fog, while those on Ajax's would prefer to believe they won entirely due to their superior skills, but the truth probably falls somewhere between the two. You need only to look at the nature of the goals to see that any time the ball reached the box, there was a chance it was going to go into the net because the players couldn't properly see it. And they just, um, every time they seem to go down the pitch, they seem to score. Yet then the question becomes why the ball keeps ending up at Liverpool's end rather than Ajax's. The freakish events in the final third can be blamed on the weather, but what happens between that in the midfield is why Ajax's superior play was making itself felt. 
As we have seen several times in this series so far, when Liverpool dominate the midfield, they win. But when they fall short there, they lose. And this was no exception. Cruyff and Ninga would drop off for Ajax, while Swart would come deep to pick up the ball, helping Ajax's midfielders Hank Groot and Benny Muller by outnumbering Liverpool's. Here, for example, Naninga drops into midfield, occupying Liverpool's midfielders so that Groot is left free to receive the ball between the lines. Ajax's success in midfield wasn't entirely their own doing, though. St. John was typically a striker, and Strong had joined the club from Arsenal two years prior as an inside forward, meaning neither of the two in the middle were natural midfielders. Now, it's not like they were complete amateurs at this role. Strong had been competently filling in whenever Milne was out injured, while the combative St. John was more than capable of being a nuisance to opponents when defending, energetically covering ground and tackling. Were these two the pairing you wanted going up against one of the best teams in Europe, though, especially when they would be left outnumbered by the opposition forwards dropping back? No, probably not. The pair weren't helping matters by pushing forward into attack in a bid to get Liverpool back into the game, emptying out the midfield so there was no one there when Liverpool lost the ball, allowing Ajax to have free reign. It was exactly this that caused Shankly to wander out onto the pitch, recalling later, We were 2-0 down and they started raiding. They were stung and went mad and tried to retrieve the game. So I went onto the pitch while the game was in progress and was walking about in the fog. And I said to them, Christ, this is only the first game. There's another bloody game at Liverpool. So we don't go and give away any more goals. Let's get beat 2-0. We are not going too bad. Take it easy. I walked onto the pitch, talked to the players and walked off again. And the referee never saw me. This weakening of Liverpool's midfield was partly due to injuries. Their one natural midfielder on the pitch was Stevenson, and he had been shunted out to left-back to cover for the missing burn. However, it was also hubris. At this point in his career, Milne was in and out of the team due to injuries, but given he played against Sheffield United at the weekend, and would start three days later against Manchester United, it's probably safe to say he would have been available for this match, yet he was nowhere to be seen. Liverpool likely thought St John and Strong would be more than enough to overpower this weak little Dutch side no one had heard of, but it soon became clear this wasn't the case. Moving Stevenson to left-back weak in the midfield, but also didn't do much to help the defence. Swart was at the centre of everything for Ajax, moving deep to pick up the ball then dribbling forward into attack down the right, with Stevenson completely unable to stop him. Stevenson getting beaten required Ron Yates to keep coming across to the flanks to cover, leaving space in the centre for Ajax to exploit. It was this that led to the opening goal, with Swart beating Peter Thompson then Stevenson on the flank forcing Yates to come across and knock the ball out for the throw in Ajax scored from. The second was the same. Liverpool gave the ball away and there was no one in midfield, so Ajax could easily play the ball wide to Swart, who again dribbled past three players and forced Yates across. Yates moving wide obviously left space in the centre, but it was even more than usual as Tommy Smith had vacated this space for some reason too, pushing up into midfield. Why exactly he did this isn't clear, but the best answer is probably that he was trying to fill the gap left by St John not tracking back. However, this in turn created a hole in the defence. Swart cut the ball back into the middle to Ninga, who, with Lawler breathing down his neck, snatched a quick shot at goal. Lawrence saved the initial shot, but the rebound fell to the unmarked Cruyff, left free by Smith stepping up into midfield to slot into the net. Although this time Yates wasn't drawn wide thanks to Liverpool having men back for the corner, the fourth goal also came from Swart dribbling down the right and crossing into the box. The goals themselves may have been freakish, but there was a clear pattern to how they were created that Liverpool were unable to stop. You couldn't see really, it should have been pulled off. But what we didn't realise, how good a team they were, you know, over the next few years. We won the European Cup a few times. And it's another one! Oh my goodness me! Despite being 4-0 down at half-time, Liverpool hadn't been completely out of the game though. Like Swar, Ian Callaghan was causing Ajax problems with his dribbling on the right. While they were also able to pass around Ajax to work the ball forward, Liverpool were very clearly second best, but the scoreline wasn't completely reflective of play. Ajax reacted by dropping back into their own half of the second period, getting all 11 men back behind the ball to defend. This denied Liverpool space. Even if they could beat an Ajax player or two, there would be another close by to steal in and stop them. But it also made it easier to deal with the fog. The miss was even worse late on than it had been in the first half, but packing their box with players meant that even if they couldn't see the ball, it was much more likely to land at the feet of an Ajax player than a Liverpool one. Taking defeat about as well as he usually did, Shankly would decry these tactics after the game, saying, This was ridiculous. Ajax played defensive football on their own ground. We never play well against defensive teams. It sounded bizarre coming from someone who had just been soundly thrashed, but he actually had more of a point than would be immediately obvious. It was rare it was time for teams to pull all their players back into their own half like this, and this kind of pragmatic discipline would remain a feature of Mickles' team. 
the discussion of total football is always about the defenders bombing forward into attack and never the attackers dropping back to cover for them in defence. Shankly was being very one-eyed in ignoring the first half in its criticism of Ajax, but there was an element of truth to it. Already thinking ahead to the second leg, Liverpool didn't really make any changes to get back into the game. Smith would push forward into midfield, but that was pretty much it. Ajax added yet another with a quarter of an hour left to play. A heavy touch by Smith handed the ball to Cruyff and he burst forward on the counter. Yates cut him down, handing Ajax a free kick in shooting territory. With Lawrence likely unable to even see it, Groot simply fired the ball straight at goal. Liverpool did manage to pull a goal back with the final kick of the match though. It was very similar to Ajax's third goal. From a corner, the ball pinballed around the box until Lawler finally scrambled it across the line. Given it was basically invisible to television viewers, it's difficult to imagine the players could see it much better. I know I scored a late goal, but I um, <laughs> don't think anybody knew about it, you know. The match would finish 5-1 to Ajax, Liverpool's worst defeat in Europe to this day. The poor conditions obviously inflated the score, however Liverpool were being caught off guard by a team they hadn't shown the proper respect towards. If they were going to advance to the quarter-finals, they were going to have to pull off something incredible at Anfield. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to support the channel. You can get updates on what I'm doing by following on Twitter and Facebook, links are in the description, but most importantly by supporting Holding Me Field on Patreon. Without financial support, I can't justify the time it goes into making these videos to keep the channel alive while also receiving access to premium content. Thanks for watching.